I would like to call the college of complexes to order. Will all of our esteemed senators please take your conversations to the cloakroom? Order. Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'll be uh, filming and moderating tonight along with Andy Anderson. And tonight we have a speaker whose name is Scott M. Hoffman, who we'll, I'll introduce a little later on. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we have some brief announcements. Then we have our speaker who will speak. Then we will have a question and answer period. After our question and answer period, we will then have our infamous rebuttal period where you can speak on or off subject. Usually each rebuttal is about three to four minutes long. So, if we're looking to get announcements up here now, let's start off with the announcements. The first one will be that this uh, meeting will be filmed for posterity's sake and be up on YouTube. You can find past videos of the College of Complexes at the uh, College of Complexes website. Click on the camera and go back to 2010. And the second is uh, you can also go to my website, which is www.timsvideo.com. Charlie, if you have an awesome, come on up. Well, I was wondering, I went looking for a video of my presentation. Really. That's because it still needs to be uploaded from last week. And it's in the process About of being. Some people asked me to see it. We're, uh, it'll be uploaded. They wanted to see it. What's the difference between seeing it on the website and then the YouTube? Nothing. The, web, the website goes to the YouTube link. Everybody and we will have probably by Monday last week's and this week's up and running. Again, I was running a little behind on some videos this week. A uh, little bit, got a little sick at home over the week. So, kept me a little slack, but we'll be caught up fairly quickly. All right, who else has announcements? Come on up. Uh, he's actually got an announcement. Yeah. I apologize. I've been been a little slacking on the oil and war and politician and uh, transportation report. But a moment of silence for Mr. Bush, father of our oil wars. Did the first one back in the 90s for Iraq and uh, Kuwait. Um, and I just wanted to point out that my step grandfather was in the Purple Gang. Who's the speaker? Oh, he's over here. That's right. Oh, so you know about him? Oh, yeah. yeah, okay, good. Oh, yeah. Right, so, good. <laughs> say nice things about him. Oh, no, no. He didn't kill anybody. got an announcement? Charlie? Oh, there she's right there. Sorry, thank you, Tim. December 11th, uh, there on Tuesday, December 11th, from 5.30 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time, at the UIC Forum, that's 725 West Roosevelt Road, there will be a mayoral candidates forum on housing and equitable development. Uh, this is sponsored by the Neighbors for Affordable Housing and uh, nine other groups. Uh, and um, uh, I'll try to be quick. Uh, it says here, we are facing the worst housing affordability crisis that the country has ever seen. Join 800 Chicagoans from across the city who want to see the new mayor solve it. From all sides of our town, uh, citizens are coming together on December 11th to ask candidates who are running for mayor and vying for our votes to take a strong central stand on ending the housing affordability crisis and promoting equitable patterns of development across Chicago's uh, diverse uh, neighborhoods. Uh, I'm interested because I'm fascinated with this uh, next uh, mayoral race and at this point in time I have no idea who the next mayor of Chicago is going to be. Uh, again, that's going to be Tuesday, December 11th at 5.30 uh, p.m. at the UIC Forum, 725 West Roosevelt Road. All right, next announcer. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Go ahead. Second Saturday Coffee House is having a performance of an operatic soprano, Christine oh, yeah. Steyer, some Mozart, some Kurt Weill, some Leonard Bernstein, and some festive songs. I have flyers. 
Right. Hey guys, uh, Governor Pat Quinn will be joining the Libertarian Party of Chicago this Tuesday uh, at the Piggery on Irving Park Road at 7 p.m. We're going to discuss referendums and uh, get the uh, get the status of the uh, mayoral term limits referendum uh, that was just. Uh, in on the ballot so that's uh tuesday 7 p.m piggery on irving park road thank you all right yeah how'd you get quinn he's, a, he's my buddy what's he doing uh talking to a bunch of libertarians all right uh this doesn't happen all the time but the canadian pacific holiday train is decorated with lights and they have a flat car with uh, entertainment, Christmas entertainment, but it's coming through Chicago uh, Sunday and Thursday. It, uh, I've got a schedule here, but it'll be in, if you know these towns, Pine, Ingree Grove, Byron, Savannah, Bensonville, and Bernie. So if you want to go see it, it's the uh, most spectacular holiday like display in the United yes. States. The railroads do this. So. All right, next. Uh, yeah, it's pretty good. Who are seeing it? I've got a video of this Christmas train. But um, tomorrow at 12.30, actually the meeting starts at 1 o'clock. 1 to 4 will be the Chicago chapter of the Chicago Democratic Socialist of America. And they're going to be meeting on the West Loop at Halstead and Madison at the Crown Plaza uh, meeting room. I've been there for other events. Uh, that's at, at, at actually at one o'clock. It's on Halstead and Madison Street, right on the corner. And um, if you're a friend of the earth as I am, uh, on Monday at seven o'clock will be. Uh, a meeting of the Chicago Cook County Greens. Uh, we'll be discussing the mayoral, upcoming mayoral election. That's Monday, December 3rd, 7 p.m. at the Sulcher Regional Library, 4455 North Lincoln. So you've got a number of things to go to. Uh, we are booked up. We've got brand new schedules. Uh, that we printed up of our upcoming schedules. We've got this thing coming up before the holidays. Like should 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 we had some should Scrooge have told the ghost to get lost? I think it'd be an interesting sure. one. But um, we're booking February. The next open date is February the second. I'm looking to have. And we have a Saturday, February 23rd, just before the mayoral elections. If anybody's got any, if you know of any candidates who'd like to speak or like to put together a mayoral type program for, let's say, the 23rd, I'm holding that open. Uh, please see me and, and we'll get together on that. And although I'm not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for next week's topic. The next is going to be on senior citizens' issues. Um, but a group that is not presented at the college, they're looking forward to this, uh, called Compassion and Choices. And they're a nationwide organization that looks at, and they call it end of life, but also senior care issues and any number of other issues uh, regarding those uh, that have accumulated a few years, you know. And I'm glad to see Patrick Butler here, the reporter. I thought you were in hiding. In hiding? Yeah, he's a reporter. I thought well, you, were, you were hiding from Trump. And, yeah. <laughs> You're an enemy of the people. No, hey, you can hide in my basement, Butler. <laughs> Yeah. No truck wants for Christmas. What? A new grain. What? A new grain. Oh, okay. But anyhow, uh, get yourself scheduled and help yourself to the rest of the literature. Thank you very much. Anyone want to copy of this? Let me know. Good to see you, Victor.
Yeah. Yeah. An enemy of the people. All right. You know Tonight we have a. <laughs> Tonight we have an author of a book, Inside by Scar. Eh. My pardon, please. Inside by Scott M. Hoffman is an intriguing work detailing the inner workings of the outfit, an organized crime family which originated on the south side of Chicago during Prohibition and rose to power in the 1920s. The outfit has been involved in a wide variety of criminal activities, including gambling, loan sharking, prostitution, drug trafficking, money laundering, extortion, labor racketeering, adult and child pornography, political corruption, and murder. The individuals and events in, in Inside are composites of real people and real events. Let's welcome to our esteemed College of Complexes, our author, Scott M. Hoffman. Excuse me, sorry, sorry, sorry. All set? Yeah. First of all, I'd like to thank the uh, College of Complex for inviting me to speak tonight, and especially uh, Mr. Charles Paddock. I was able to come in contact with and uh, talked up a little bit about my book. The name of my book is Inside. I'm the author, Scott M. Hoff. The book, the, the book, the book is uh, being sold on Amazon. If you put in my name, Scott M. Hoffman, in it, then the title Inside, you will see the, uh, the book there. Also, if you want uh, to order the book, you can order it through Barnes & Noble. And uh, they do not stock it, but you can order it. Before I begin to talk about Inside and Mob Life a little bit, normally I like to give a little history about my father, because I get the question all the time, how did my father get involved? Well, before I begin that, I'm an insider's kid. My father was an underboss for Paul Rica. He was a consigliere for Sam Giancana. He was a consigliere for Joey Ayupa. And he reported to Tony Accardo. And he had the financial plan for Las Vegas. So I'm uh, quite aware of, uh, you know, of what goes on in mob life. Now, my father, a lot of times people will always say to me, how did he get started? Well, my father originally was from Milwaukee, and when he was two years old and his brother was six years old, his father died. So the mother moved to Chicago, the relative had a building on Taylor and Ogden, and that's where they moved. So he was a good student in high school. He was a good student, especially in high school, is okay? Yeah, it's better. So, okay. Okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. He was a very good student in high school. He worked in the cafeteria. He got to know the vice principal. And the vice, vice principal said, what do you want to do after high school? Would you like to go to college? And my father says, yes, I would you know, like to go to college. I want to become a doctor. I want to become a surgeon. And the vice principal said, okay, let me see what I can do. And he was able to arrange a scholarship at the University of Chicago. So when he told his mother, his, his mother had, they had remarried, and the man she married was in the camp union. He had five children. It was his children first, and her children came second. And he used to hit my father when my father was small. My father had a rough life with him. And his mother said, no, you got to go to work. Forget about this school business. So at that point, my father was a member of the Jewish Community Center. They called it the JPI around Taylor and Ogden. And he was about 18, 19 years old. And he was going to, he was on the swimming team. And in front of uh, Taylor and Ogden, before he would cross the street, was Sam Giancana and the 42s. Now the 42s were the guys, they hung out at the 42nd Street Cafe on Taylor Street. That's why they took the name the 42s. And Sam Giancana told my father, said, if you want to go across the street, it's going to cost you two pennies or three pennies in those days. And my father didn't have the two or three pennies. And Sam Chink, I said, well, you're not going across the street. He took a little pen knife, he stabbed it in my father's hand. Okay, so my father went, took, went home, took it out. And the next day, he was uh, went back to the JPI because he was on the swim team. And sure enough, Sam Chink is there in the 42s. 
and the same thing, Sam Chin kind of says, you're going to need two or three pennies to cross the street. So my father said, you're not going to get two or three pennies. And this time, as Sam Chin kind of started to move at him, he punched him and knocked him down. Well, the guys who were part of the 42s, they were all young guys. They were Felix Aldericio, Sam Tietz Pataglia, Sam Di Stefano, the Fifi Bussieri. And they all started to make a move at that point towards my father. And Sam Chin kind of said, wait a minute, wait a minute. So he said to my father, he said, can you teach me how to swim on the swim team? And my father says, well, I can try. He says, but my father said, you got to change your name. It's going to be Sam Rosenberg. We can't use Sam Giancana. <laughs> so he became Sam Rosenberg. And it's one of the aliases he would use years later that he was Sam Rosenberg. And my father tried to teach him to swim. He was able to teach him to float a little bit, but that was about, about the best you could do with Sam Giancana. He was too, uh, I would say, wild in the water. It wasn't, it wasn't his thing. Okay, so from that point, Sam Jane kind of says, well, what do you do? You know, how do you earn a living? My father says, I'm looking for a job. He says, can you drive a beer truck? My father says, yeah, I could drive a beer truck. And I don't know if he could or he couldn't, but that's what he told Sam Jane kind of. And Sam Jane kind of says, I'm going to be the shotgun. Okay, we're going to drive to Milwaukee. And they started to drive a beer truck for Al Capone, as they called him, Big Al. And that's how my father and Sam Jane kind of started to get close. And uh, from that point on, my father was introduced by Sam Giancana to Paul Rico. Now, Paul Rico was a bodyguard along with Tony Accardo of Big Al. But Paul Rico was a very, very smart guy and understood how things were really working in, with uh, mob life. And Al Capone trusted him on a lot of things. Tony Accardo was a roughneck. He was from the area they called the Patch. And uh, he really didn't have any uh, interest in a lot of things and uh, was just a bodyguard, basically. So one day, my father's telling uh, Sam Giancana, and they were, you know, was working, like I say, driving the truck, going to uh, Milwaukee a lot of times, coming back. And uh, he's telling Sam Giancana that. He said, I'm going to be playing cards today with a friend of mine, Dr. Schwimmer. And Sam Giancana said, yeah, okay, Dr. Schwimmer. And he says, well, where are you playing? He says, well, they, they play on Clark Street. Now, Schwimmer just went in and played cards with these guys. He wasn't you know, really involved with these guys. And he says to my father, and my, Sam Jean Kai says, don't go. So my father says, well, why shouldn't I go? He says, I'm just telling you, don't go. So he figures if Sam Jean Kai is telling him don't go, he's not going to go. So he doesn't go, and thank goodness he didn't go, otherwise I would have had a different father, because that was the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And Tony Accardo was one of the shooters in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. So then at, in the early 1930s, uh, after knowing Paul Rica, Sam Giancana went away to prison on a burglary charge. And he told my father, can you just kind of keep an eye on my mother? Which in Italian life, even though these guys are, do what they do and are violent and criminal, when it comes to Mother's Day, I'll tell you, Mother's Day is the only day that everybody gets a pass. And everybody goes to see their mother. Okay? Now, normally at the end of the day, if they see their mother early, then you've got a problem because then they're going to go out and whack somebody later that night. If they go for dinner, get home 9, 10 o'clock at night, their stomach's full, forget about it. They'll wait till the next day. Okay? So Sam Giancana asked him to take care of his mother. And my father was a good cook. He was a very handy guy. He could do electrical work. He could do uh, uh, carpentry. He could do plumbing. He could do, you know, he was just one of those type of guys. He probably should have been a building management. He probably would have been, you know, an excellent worker. So he went over to see Sam Giancana's uh, mother, and Sam Giancana's mother was, uh, you know, not eating like she should be. So he starts cooking for her, and he puts a little garlic in the hamburger, and, oh, she likes that. Oregano in the hamburger, oh, she likes that. So in, in the meantime, he's talking with Paul Rica, and Paul Rica says, I'd like you to come and work for me. Now, at that point, and this is a good trivia question for a lot of people. You might be able to use it. And they ask you, well, who was convicted with Al Capone when Al Capone got convicted uh, for tax evasion? And it was Frank Nitti. But Capone got 11 years and Nitti got 18 months. At that point, while Nitti was away, uh, Paul Rica took over control of the outfit at that point. And he asked my father to work for him. My father was, you know, was like 23, 24 years old. He was young. And uh, he said to... Uh, Paul Rico, okay, and I, he wanted my father, after knowing my father a few years, he said, I think you've got a feel for this business. 
So my father said, well, I don't know if I do or I don't. He says, I want you to take over a crew. Now eventually, and I'll explain to you a little bit later, my father was an underboss. But in those days, they really didn't have street crews, and they really didn't have a delineation of an underboss conciliary. That's going to come a little bit later, and I'll talk about that. So Paul Rico puts him in charge of a street crew. Now the street crew that he put him in charge of was black hands. And the black hands were very violent, very uh, uncontrollable. They were all Sicilians. And uh, they were just very uncontrollable. They were all over the city doing whatever they want, whenever they wanted, to whoever they wanted. It. And uh, they didn't like Frank Nitty at all. They hated Nitty. And so my father started, the first thing when he started talking to me, he says, why do you guys have a problem? What bothers you? And they said, the money. We're not getting paid. Which in mob life, you don't always get paid the first of the 16th. You get paid when they want to pay you. Sometimes it's the first of the month, sometimes the last of the month, sometimes you miss a month. So, Paul, so my father said, look, if you can bring in the money, you get on the street and bring in the money, I'll talk with Paul Rico about seeing if you get paid every Friday. Now, the black hands, like I say, being the type of people that they were, they were very uh, you know, violent, and they would go out on their own. They weren't really mob people, you see, at that point. They were working kind of in conjunction with the outfit, but they really weren't part of the outfit. But they, because they were running their own separate operation. They would go into a business, they would ask for extortion money. A guy would say, a business owner would throw them out, say, get the hell out of here, you know, get out of here. And uh, what they would do that night, they'd put a picture of a black hand on the door. And that was a signifying that they're going to come back tomorrow, they're going to ask you for the money. If you don't give the money, then things are going to happen. So you go back the next day, and we want you know, 2%, 3%, whatever they were asking. And the guy said, get the hell out of here. You know, it's my business. I'm not giving you any extortion money. There's, I'm not having any problems. No one's doing anything. That night, they start out with what my father would always refer to as phase one. They break the windows. That's the first phase. So they break all the windows. And then they come back the next morning, and they say to the guy, look, you got a little problem in the neighborhood. OK? You can see, you know, your windows are broken. So the guy is starting to get a little concerned, because the next phase would be they go after the guy physically. They would beat the guy. So he starts paying extortion money. And then they move on to the next. Well, they start really hustling work in the street. And they start bringing in the money. My father goes to Paul Rico. He says, Paul, look, these guys are bringing in the money, and you're going to get your 10%. Because basically, your boss would get 10% of whatever is working on the street. It's kicked up 10% to him. So Paul Rico liked it because he's getting more money. So he says, sure, yeah, we'll pay him every Friday. So. Every Friday, the black hands got paid. My father would play cards with them, you know, that type of stuff. So we got along well with the black hands. Well, in 1943, this was known as the Hollywood case. And Paul Rica and other outfit guys were convicted of shaking down Hollywood studios. They had control of the unions. And they were shaking down Warner Brothers and Metro Golden Mayor, and basically telling them, look, if you don't pay us, you're not going to have a movie because our unions aren't going to come to work. And that's always the old trick. If you don't pay, they don't come to work. You know, you can't get nothing built. You can't have your movies. You can't have anything. Well, so I guess there were some complaints to the feds, and the feds convicted them. But in 1943, uh, Tony Accardo, my father encouraged Tony Accardo to always go visit Paul Rico and talk to him and pick his brain, see what he knew. Because he said to Tony, he said, maybe someday you're going to be running the show. So in 1943, Tony Accardo took over the outfit and ran the outfit for almost the next 50 years. And he met with my father, and he asked my father, he says, look, what are we going to do with the black hands? Because there's always still concern about the black hands. Black hands were always in the back of pretty much everybody's mind because you never knew when they were going to erupt, what they were going to do, when they were going to start. So my father said, look, we'll set up street crews. And that's when they started to set up street crews. We'll give the Black Hands Taylor Street. This one will get Elmwood Park. This one will get uh, you know, Chinatown. And all the street crews developed at that point. And they all, my father also talked to Tony Cardo. He says, and we'll have underbosses. And an underboss will run a street crew. And they'll pick up to the boss. And we'll have a consigliere. Who they, sometimes they call 
Michael, uh, this guy Michael Cohn, a consigliere on television. I'm sure you've seen it many, many times. And he is no consigliere. And I'll, I'll tell you why. First of all, no lawyer. I know in The Godfather, that movie, Robert Wall played a role of Tom Hagen, a consigliere for The Godfather, Marlon Brand. But in real life, a consigliere is never a lawyer. These guys, first of all, don't like their lawyers because they say they charge too much. So you would never see a lawyer. Also, a lawyer would never put himself in the position where if he gets convicted, he loses his license. Okay, so what happens to the lawyer? You no longer can practice law. So you never see a, a lawyer as a consigliere. So also at that point, my father talked with Tony Cardo and says, look, we have to set up retribution, obviously, because you're going to have problems with guys crossing lines in the street crew. This guy's going to want that territory, that guy's going to want that territory. We need something set up. So they set up their own, basically, their own uh, enforcement. And if anyone was going to hit anybody, anyone was going to whack anybody, anyone was going to clip anybody, which is all the same terms, they had to talk to Tony Accardo. They had to get his approval at that point. So that was the choke point to stop uh, what would happen on the street where guys would start randomly start killing guys because they want they want the territory of some other street crew. And also, at that point also, the uh, union money that was coming in was, Tony Carter was getting 10%. My father talked to uh, him about it and says, when Claw gets out, you, look, you and him will split the five. Because labor racketeering was very, very big. Uh, there was a lot of money coming in from the, excuse me, from the unions and uh, all the union activity. So pretty much from that point on, my father was working pretty close with uh, Tony Accardo, and he was also working, eventually he'd be working with Sam Giancana, and when Paul Rica got out. And when, in 1955, my father had an idea about Las Vegas. Now he was very much aware of the operation that was run in Havana in the late 1940s and early 50s. And that operation was run by Mayor Lansky out of New York, it was hotels, it was casinos, it was like what Las Vegas would turn into. So in, in 1955, my father went out to see what was going on in Las Vegas. You had the Flamingo Hotel in 1946 that was uh, opened by Bugsy Siegel, and the Sands was, you know, basically was open also at that point. So my father saw potential in it. So he goes back and he thinks about what, what plan would be needed. And he came up with the idea of taking the Teamster money out, taking money out of the Teamster pension fund, not health and welfare. Okay? But he wanted to cover it with casualty insurance. So if anything happened, guys would get their pension, they get their medical. And no one ever didn't get their pension, no one didn't ever get their medical. But he figured if something happens, they'll be covered. So he goes back and he starts talking with Paul Rico first. And he starts talking about Las Vegas and Paul Rico was like Sam Giancana, they weren't real interested in it. It was a flash in the pan. They thought it might be a flash in the pan. He talks with Tony Accardo, Tony Accardo says, forget about it, it's a flash in the pan. It's a little rinky-dink type town, nothing's gonna happen there, forget about it. And there was nothing at that point, maybe 1955, my father could do, because Dave Beck was head of the Teamster Union. He was the president of the union out of St. Louis. And he was not gonna be interested in what was going on. But a guy became first vice president that my father knew originally, way back in Detroit, and he gave him money when he first ran for his first local office as secretary treasurer of his local. And he liked my father because, like I say, my father gave him money when he had no money. So he would always come to Chicago, he'd talk with my father, and he says, if I become union president, you and I are going to talk about Las Vegas, because he talked to Las, about Las Vegas with him. And that man was Jimmy Hoffa. Okay. So in 1957, Dave Beck gets indicted for embezzlement, and first vice president Jimmy Hoffa moves up to become president of the Teamster Union, and also gets elected as in the Teamster Union. So now my father has a bargaining chip, but he goes back and he talks with Tony Accardo and Paul Rica, and Sam Giancana now in 57 has taken over day-to-day -day operation. Tony Accardo had succeeded to. Uh, Sam Gene Conn, and he was running day-to-day -day operation for the outfit. And what happened was my father said, look, we'll money launder the gambling money and all the money we have from Chicago in Las Vegas, we'll wash it, we'll bring it back clean. 
right away Tony Carter goes, whoa, wait a minute. That, hey, that sounds pretty good. I mean, we're going to take the gambling money. We're going to buy chips in Vegas. We're going we're to cash the chips in. We're going to bring the money back to Chicago. And it's going to be all clean. We're going to do what we want. Our father says, yeah, that's the plan. So Tony Accardo, right away, now he's on the bandwagon for Las Vegas. Now it's, now it's looking good to him, OK? So my father talks with Jimmy Hoffa. Jimmy Hoffa was a very, very straightforward guy, OK? He was not a run around. He wasn't a chaser. His wife, Josephine, he loved her very much and a very good, good relationship. The only thing he was concerned about was what's in it for my guys. And I kind of talk about that a little in the book, OK? What's in it for my guys? In other words, what are the jobs going to be? So he's concerned about what the jobs are going to be. What are they going to get out of it? Okay. So my father tells him construction, excuse me, construction and other types of jobs. So he pretty much signs off on it and goes along with the plan. So my father then would start going to Las Vegas. And I would start going with my father when I was 10 years old to Las Vegas. And the outfit built and controlled seven hotels. They controlled Riviera. Desert Inn, known as the DI, Stardust, Hacienda, Golden Nugget, um, Sahara, and the Fremont. Those were the seven. And my father wanted to go after La, uh, Caesar's Palace. Okay? And he wanted to choke off their revenue. And the way he would do that was the outfit had control of the uh, businesses that dealt with the hotels the linen service, the food service, the liquor service. All of those were under outfit control. And my father wanted to go after Caesars when Caesars was built in 66. That was a New York hotel. Like Tropicana was a New York hotel. That was built with New York money. But they wouldn't want to do it. And, you know, that was, that was it. So, like I say, and they, they wanted him to run the uh, pension fund. My father knew that was a hot potato. See, my father always worked straight jobs, regular jobs. He'd be a supervisor in a factory, uh, assembly lines, he'd run a stock room. And he did all this because you have to show income. And the income he was showing was legit income. He'd get his W-2 and a little interest on the checking account, and that was what he would show the government. Now, twice he got letters from the IRS criminal division, who does the investigation. Uh, for tax evasion, tax fraud, a failure to file an income tax return, a false income tax return, a tax misdemeanor. And both times he got letters from them, 10 year period separated them, and nothing ever really happened at that point. So um, he would lose his jobs. I mean, the FBI would come to talk to him, you know, at work, and they'd show him pictures. And then personnel in those days, now it's human resources, would call him and says, what the FBI want to talk to you about? He says, well, I play cards with these guys, you know. Well, who are these guys? Well, you know, they're just guys. Well, who are these guys? They're just guys. And they would fire him that day. My father would be out of work. So he would have to look for another job. But you don't get a job every day. So we'd get kicked out of apartments, my sister, my mother, myself. We'd get thrown out because we weren't pay able to pay the rent until my father would get a job. Well, I decided after... I retired from the city of Chicago for 35 years, June 30th, 2012. I said to myself, what did I you know, want to do? And I thought about writing. I have a degree in journalism. I'll talk about going to college in New York where I went. And I thought about the subject matter. I said to myself, it's a subject matter I knew. People would say to me, why don't you write a book? Scott, why don't you write a book? And I, I couldn't tell them how I knew but I was going to have to, you know, and just I would tell them why, just something I know. I couldn't tell them why I know, how I know, what was going on in my life. So I started writing June, I waited a week, I gave myself a week. On July 9th, 2012, I started writing Inside. And after the first page, I knew I had something, but I didn't know if anyone would be interested. Now, I didn't tell anybody. My only living relative in Chicago was my nephew. I did not tell him, I did not tell anybody. Because my father had always told me, if it's something important to you, never tell one person, ever. Because one person knows, one person can hurt you. If you're the only one that knows, you'll never get hurt. Because you're the only one that has the information. So I wrote 
my book, and it was took me two years. And finally, after 20 rejections, I got 20 rejections, 18 times I got the book. I got the manuscript back, same envelope, same box from FedEx. I used to go to Lincoln and Pratt. I lived not real far from there. FedEx office lady would say to me, Catherine Scott, don't give up, keep going. Because after, you know, you get the rejection sometimes. It came, one rejection came with seven below zero at night. I'm getting, I'm coming home and there's, a, there's my box again. So finally I found a, comp, a publisher in Pittsburgh, Dorrance Publishing, said, the problem is I have a computer, but I don't know how to do it on the computer. I had 840 handwritten pages. That was my manuscript. So I found a, na a former neighbor told me she had a friend who could do the work for me. She does work for lawyers and that she could do the work. So I contacted her, and sure enough, her and her daughter worked on it. Three months later, she sent it to me on email. I had someone help me on the attachment. I sent it to Doris, Doris Publishing. And a week after they got my email, they offered me a contract for the book. They were very interested in the book. The book starts out in 1956, when I was eight years old. Now, all, all the people in the book are, the book is fictional. The names are fictional but they, they're composites of real people and real events. But it's just the book had to be written fictional because of legal matters. So it's uh, you know events that took place. So the book really starts out in 1956 when I'm eight years old. My father's whole approach was, you're gonna see everything and you're gonna make up your decision if you wanna go into the life. I'm not gonna tell you, I'm not gonna force you, but you're gonna see everything. You're gonna go out and see everything. So my education, and mob life began when I was eight years old in 1956. We went to a strip club. And we went, and it was in, around Irving Park and Mannheim. I think it was called Mr. Lucky's, but I'm not sure. Okay, and the reason we're going to a strip club is the strip club was 5% street tax. It had to be collected. Strip clubs were 5%. So we go in the back of the, in the bar, in the back part, and we start to walk in. And I'll leave that part to you, to you so you can read about it in the book. But after we, after we complete the business there, and my father had talked to me before, as we drove, because I grew up in Albany Park, I grew up two blocks from where the Admiral Theater is. That's what I tell people, okay? So I'm familiar with Patsy Riccardi, who I knew him, who owned it. I know all about that. Who killed him, why he got killed. I'm very familiar with that. But my father was, would always go over things. He says, I know you're a kid. You got a kid's brain, you don't have an adult's brain, but we're gonna go over everything and every time, whatever the subject matter was, my father went over it and over it. Like a sports team, their practices, you know, like the Bears, they play on Sunday, then they practice all week and they play on Sunday. And my father would go over and over things all the time. So he explained to me what a strip club was, what went on. He said to me, he said, he said to me, he said, if there's new dancing, they can't serve liquor. And he said the drinks are watered down because we're going to want to sell the drinks, so the drinks are watered down for the you know people to come. So after we leave the strip club, the next place we go to is a B girl place, which B girl places were mobbed up. And a B girl placement was a bar girl place. And what that was was it was a dark, pretty much a dark atmosphere in the bar, a little darker than normal, I would say. And the guy would come in, sit down, start talking to the bartender, and a girl would sit next to him. A girl starts talking to him. And this was the type of place, a, third, a 50 cent beer became a $3, it was a $3 beer. A dollar mixed drink was $5. And the girl would start talking to him. And the bartender kind of watered her stuff down. And she would start laughing at his jokes. She'd start to rub his arm, rub his shoulder. You know, he would then, and yes, you know, men do, you know, when they, a woman shows attention, uh, they start to open up about their life, and a lot of these guys maybe didn't have a happy home life for whatever reason. And the girls are listening, and they're smiling, and they're agreeing with them. And in the meantime, these guys are being fed drinks, and their bills going higher and higher and higher and higher. And this is the whole game. And at the end of the night, the guy will say, well, you know, like, let's go to a motel. And she'll give him one of these. Say, we're not going to the motel. Have a nice evening. And walk away from him. And he might have a $50 bill, which is a lot of money in those days. Okay? Because we're talking late, you know, mid-50s at that point. So my father always he explained to me what a B-girl place was, what that was, you know, how that worked. 
Well, from that point on, like I say, my street education began. And one of the things I had to learn was assimilate with the students and people in my neighborhood. These were people like yourself, working people, average, you know, type people. They weren't having the life I was having. They weren't seeing what I was seeing. But yet I had to assimilate and, you know, fit in with them. And I remember, you know, it would be tough. Um, I remember fourth grade, we had, multiple, I think it was multiplication. A teacher writes six times five equals what? And I'm looking around, I'm like, well, I'm not paying a lot of attention because I've been out that night with my father. And she says, Scott, what's six times five? And I said, oh, uh, 30. Now in loan sharking, six times five means 500 is the principal. You come to me. You want to borrow 500 principal. Well, the interest is $600. So the next week you've got to pay $1,100. And then it doubles down each week, 2200 you know, uh, 4400 you know. It keeps going on and on and on. So I'm sitting there, and, you know, like I said, I gave the answer, but I'm thinking, well, six for five is loan shark. And I'm not really thinking about my classwork. My street education I knew as well or better than my ABCs. And one thing that was probably uh, difficult for me, and I have a lot of personal scars from it, was I went out with juice collectors and street enforcers. And I knew these guys weren't quite right, but I didn't know what was, you know, like wrong with them. I knew they were not the right guys. So by the time I was 13 years old, I'd seen maybe 100 beatings. I'd see guys beat with a baseball bat, with a two by four, with a, a, a police baton with uh, bicycle chains, uh, with uh, brass knuckles, okay? So I saw a lot, I saw an awful lot. And it's juice collectors were the muscle. Now some of them were juice collection, which would be collecting on loans, interest, and street enforcement. And the street enforcement would be picking up street tax. And like I say, I knew these guys right away. There was something not right about it, but I'm still, I got a kid's brain. I don't have an adult's brain, okay? So my father starts to tell me, he says, I'll tell you later. So he waits till I'm about 14, and he explains what sociopathic and psychotic was. And I realized, after him explaining what sociopathic and psychotic behavior was, I'm looking at it. I'm seeing it every day. I'm seeing these guys. This is what they do. Now, not everybody in, in the outfit could do this type of work, okay? They were not always cut out for that. Some guys that were books, bookies, that wasn't their thing. But in talking with these guys, as I got to know guys like Frank Schwiez, you know, other guys like him, Tony Spilaccio, Harry Alderman, guys like that, I started to find out what went on in their life. And a lot of these kids had a lot of fights when they were kids. They were rebellious. There was something going on either neurological, or there's something going on in the brain. In those days, parents never check things out, and they let things go. They would get kicked out of school, one school after another, or they would, some of them were, were harmful to animals. They'd set a cat on fire, they'd set a dog on fire, which is a sign of a sociopathic behavior. So when, when these guys became members in the outfit, when they joined the outfit, the nature of the things they did was just an extension of what they were doing basically as kids. The violence they were committing was basically as kids. So that was uh, a very tough part always in my life, you know, seeing that. But this was what the outfit, this is my father said. He said, you can see everything in this way. He says, you're not going in with your eyes blind. Because most kids that would follow in their footsteps of their father, their uncle, they never talk about it. Nothing is ever spoken about the outfit. They don't know what their father does where he goes, all he knows is he comes home with money, and they're not sure what, what this is all about. So, uh, my father, like I said, he wanted me to see everything. And besides the street education that you heard before about the gambling loan shark, I learned all about frauds. Insurance frauds, real estate frauds, social security fraud, any type of financial fraud I saw that was done. Securities fraud, I'm very aware of that. Pump and dump. With stocks, I'm very uh, knowledgeable, you know, about that. And I always, like I say, tell people, as as you see me, 
when people first see me and meet me, they ask me, are you a school teacher? Are you a lawyer? Are you an accountant? No one in my life, and I don't think anyone here tonight, would ask me this question. Do you come from a mob background? Well, you can it's never that. happened. Yeah. Yeah. Now, because of how I look, I can get, I could, if I was a person that had criminal intent, or criminal intentions, I could do a lot of things. Because I could get away with a lot of things. Because people do not expect it. A couple weeks ago, I'm talking with a guy at a restaurant, his wife, and I was eating with some other people. And he was there, he was friends of the people we were with. And he comes down about the book, and he says to me, well, you don't look the part. I said, well, there's not really a part. It's only what you see through the movies, through television. You think that's how it is. And that's not always, you know, not always the case. But also, the things that I learned with my father, and this was probably a, a key thing, key things, was I was with him when he paid off the corrupt politicians, the corrupt judges, corrupt law enforcement. Chicago Police Department, we had 50 guys on payroll as needed. It was always as needed. We had 30 Cook County Sheriff's Police on payroll as needed. Six. Illinois State Police on payroll as needed. Two FBI agents that were on payroll as needed. We used them quite a bit. Okay, so now the polit corrupt politicians were the key. They were always the key thing. And the reason they were the key is because of, of their tentacles of what they could do for the outfit. Guys needed jobs, okay? You know, you have to show income because otherwise, IRS criminal division, they're after you. Where, where's your income, your earned income? So the politicians would get the no-show jobs for the guys, state, uh, city, and county jobs. There would be no-show jobs. They didn't show up, they, but they'd be on the payroll, and they worked. They were supposed to work, but they weren't, they weren't working. And they were ghost payrollers, okay? And there's the same thing if you wanted to become a cop. Now, a cop cost $500 at that time to become a cop. And, the cop, and a guy who was uh, a connected guy would always say, I want my 95. I'm going to get my 95. Sure, make sure I get my 95. And what that meant was the guy would go take the test at, say, Lane Tech High School and, you know, get the test. And he would get the test booklet and he would fill out the front page. And he was always told, write down your booklet number. So he'd write down the booklet number and they tell him, don't be the first one to turn in your booklet. Wait a little bit. Wait till a few people have turned in your booklet, then just turn in your booklet. Pretend like you're doing something. Keep it open. Don't turn it in. So they would turn it in, and then the politician, the corrupt politician, would get someone in the department of personnel to pull the booklet, because he's got the number, the booklet number, and scores it 95. So that meant the next class, the connected guy, was in the police academy. That's how he got it, got his 95. Now after they graduate in the police academy, you, you, you rank as patrolman, okay? And you, in those days, you used to get your star. Above Chicago police would be a little bit that would say, a marker that would say patrolman. So connected guys, mobbed up guys, who were gonna be cops, would go through the academy and graduate and get their star that says patrolman, and everyone, would assume they were a patrolman. But some of these guys, the guys who had a lot of juice, a lot of clout, okay, they became patrol specialists. Now, patrol specialist is what, on the mayor's detail, that's what their titles are. They have a commander, but the other guys are all considered patrol specialists. And the reason they're considered patrol specialists is because that's sergeant's pay. So a mopped up guy who just graduated from the academy is now getting sergeant's pay, okay? This is how it would work. This is how things work, okay? So, you know, and as I would see this, I would say to my father, I said, you know, this things with the politician. I remember in 1959, we're at Sheridan Park, it was known as Peanut Park. And I see, through my lens, I see politicians different than anybody here. I know some people, you know, politics is important, you like to talk about it. I understand that. And so we're at Sheridan Park and it's 1959. It's a political picnic in the first ward, not far from Galileo School. And there's a guy named Gerald Arrigo. In fact, there's a plaque in Sheridan Park, which is known as Peanut Park, honoring the Honorable Gerald Arrigo. 
So Gerald Arrigo was by a tree talking near a guy, and I, I'm 10 years old, and I'm just a little bit away from my father and a couple of the other people, and I walk over, and I see him get the envelope, okay? And he puts the envelope in his sport jacket, and he sees me, and he says, kid, this is who I work for. This is who I work for. My father used to always tell me, I want to say, I say, is there any difference between Democrats and Republicans? I know philosophy. He says, Scott, forget about it. No. He said, they're just labels. He says, always remember this. A Democrat, Republican will never turn down that envelope. Okay? And he says, they will do for who they want to do for, when they want to do for. And he says, and the poor voters, he would say, they vote, but that's the last control they have over a politician. Because that's why everyone wants to be a politician. Because there's no control. You know, there's no time when they have to be anywhere unless there's a meeting. There's nothing. So, and, you know, my outlook on po politicians are, like I asked my father, are there, were there any good ones? He says, oh yeah, sure there are good ones. The ones that don't get caught. He says, those are the good ones. Those are the ones that will be around. Okay? And the politicians were very important because they got state, city, and the county contracts, and the taxpayers are paying for it. And I'll tell you what they're paying for. In construction contracts, demolition contracts, hire truck, insurance contracts for the government agencies, everything was marked up 25%. The invoices were inflated 25%. This is what the taxpayers were paying for. And what they were paying for was that guys that were uh, needed jobs would be put on the construction companies, the demolition companies, the hire truck companies, and they'd be paid off of the country. Now they were inflating the prices, so that's how they would pay them, and that's how they pay off the, uh, uh, you know, the politicians. Now when I worked for the city my first 12 years, I worked in purchasing. My next 23, I worked in the controller's office. I worked in two basically hot departments as far as one was about contracts and money and one was strictly about money. So I could write a book about my 35 years as a city employee. But even at that time, when I started February 1st, 1977, they had what they call no-bid contracts. And a lot of these state and county and city contracts were no-bids. And that's who the politicians were getting them mopped up. Construction companies, mopped up demolition companies, mopped up trucking companies. Everybody was getting a piece of the pie. And it was all taxpayers had to pay for it, and taxpayers didn't know what they were paying for, and no one cared about it if the taxpayers knew what they were paying for. So, like I say, with politicians, as I always say with people, you always have to take them with a, not only a grain of salt, with a lot of salt, because they will say whatever they want, do whatever they want to you, just to get your vote. Once they're in, then everyone's friendly. So, like I say, in, in the mob life that I would see things, and I was seeing all of this, it was on you know, a continuous basis. And my father would go over everything, and we would talk about everything. And I remember the first mob family outside of Chicago. It was 1961. And before that, it was actually in 19, before, before I talk about it, 1957, uh, I was nine years old. I come home from school. It's about 3.15. My father is home. And he says, we're going to Vegas tonight. I said, we're going to Las Vegas. He says, yeah, bags are packed. Let's go. We're going. And because they had to do business. And that was my start of going to Las Vegas. Okay. And in those days, you didn't have the security like you have today. So we fly out on Friday. And my father wanted me to be at the meeting. And these meetings were with investors that set up Shell Corporation. Sidney Korshak was the lawyer out in Las Vegas, Mr. Korshak. And I talk about him, I use him as an example of one of three lawyers. Let me get the dinner, sir, in, please. In my, in my book. A guy by the name of Barry Tiger is the fictional guy in my book. So if my father didn't want me to be at the meeting, what he would do was he would set me up with a mob prostitute. And my mob prostitute would be my weekend mother. And he would, he, would, he would tell the prostitute, I'll give you money to take, my, to take Scott to lunch, to dinner, take a movie, you know. And they didn't really want to do that. They were, they were happy to do it. And one time, we were sitting in a restaurant. And I'm 11 years old. We're in Las Vegas. And a, and a uh, John comes up. 
And he says to my prostitute, he says, who's that for him to be? And she says, oh, that's my date. So, you know, like I say, uh, there was a lot going on. My father knew Joe Comforti. Now, Joe Comforti owned a Mustang ranch in Pahrump, where prostitution was legal. And Joe was uh, originally from Chicago, to some Bridgeport. He was stationed at Nellis Air Force Base. And some guys are telling him about legal prostitution. Now, being from Chicago, we knew prostitution was, you know, mob run, it wasn't legal. He said, legal prostitution? They said, yeah, Corumph. It's about an hour, 15 minutes from Las Vegas. And prostitution's legal there. So he has a, a leave period from the Air Force, and he goes over there and he sees, wow, this, you know, he sees what's going on. And he decides, comes back after he gets out of the Air Force, his girlfriend Marie, they go to Bridgeport, he comes back from Bridgeport, comes back out to Las Vegas, and then he opens up the Mustang Ranch. Now the current owner, this guy Dennis Hoff, who bought it after Joe Comforti died, uh, just died recently, changed it. But Joe and his wife, whenever I'd be out there, they always wanted me to come and stay at the ranch, stay for dinner, sleep over. Uh, my father wasn't really too hip with that. Uh, I don't know, maybe it was too many women around, maybe it was too far, but they meant it in a good sense. It wasn't anything uh, of a negative. They just, because I was, you know, I'm going out there, I'm 9, 10, 11 years old. I'm going with my father. So, you know, but like I say, that uh, you know, didn't, didn't really happen. And uh, I, would, I would, you know, go to Las Vegas. But it would be strange, I would say, with, especially with some of the kids, as I realized, as the, the older I was getting, you know, 12, 13, 14, I was way ahead of kids because of what I was seeing. Because their lives were that of a 12 or 13 or 14 year old. I never had a bike as a kid. My father never took me to a ball game. We were always doing other things. And the other things we were doing were mobs type of stuff. So I was learning, you know, criminal background. But by the time I was about 13, 14, I was kind of an old pro starting at eight on this. I had seen pretty much what the life was all about, what was going on. And I didn't really think that was going to be something that I was going to be interested in, okay? Because the main, the main really, there was two really probably main reasons. As my father would say, the life was very, very stressful, extremely stressful. It was a two-shoulder business. Over one shoulder, you're worried about being wet. The other shoulder, you got the FBI chasing you. And these guys were heavy smokers in the life. Tony Accardo used to chop wood in his backyard to relieve the tension. Paul Rico would cook to relieve the tension. Sam Giancana liked sex. That was his way of relieving the tension. Okay? So he was chasing all the time. But it was, very, it was a very, very stressful life because of that. Because it was like a chess game. You're making a, the, a, a criminal's making a move, the FBI's making a move. Criminal's making a move, the FBI's making a move. And the kids in the family and the wife would suffer. I talk about this in an incident in the book. Now, the, the wife would be told to tell the kids, father's going away to college. Where's dad? He's at college, OK? Now, the kids didn't know that he wasn't at a regular college. He was in a federal facility doing time. But he was told he's away at college. Dad's away at college. It's all, it's all you hear in mob life. Oh, he's away. He's going to college. He's, he's going to college, OK? So that's what the wife would say. But when, when the husband was away, the wife would go to see a boss about money because you have mortgage money. Maybe the kid's going to Catholic school. Uh, maybe the daughter's got a prom dress. Things that maybe you and the audience you face with your families. You know, everyday type of living expenses. And this is what a boss would say, okay, who is taking over the husband's territory. He would say, you got a money maker? Go on the street and use it. Take your body on the street and use it. That's, that's what he would tell about. That's how you make your money. They wouldn't care. Now, my father would try and help as many of the mob wives as he could. He'd try and get her money. He would talk to them, and he would try and get her money. And he would also, since he was very handy, he would tell them, look, don't call anybody. Call me. You know, if you have a leak, and your boss would call me. Bell doesn't work, call me. So he would try and get him money. And, and my wife's liked my father because of that, because he had an interest in families. Now, my father was no angel. Of course not. He was a criminal. Did he kill anybody? One time I asked him, I said, did you shoot anybody? 
And he said to me, he said, remember what I told you about? Don't tell anybody, just keep it to yourself. <laughs> That's what we're going to talk about. That's yeah. it. That's so, he, so he bypassed it. I asked Sam Giancana, what? Did my father kill anybody? He said, what did your father tell you? So I told him, he says, you know, he says, don't tell anybody, keep your mouth shut, don't say anything, you'll never get hurt because no one knows but you. Sam Jean said, that's good advice. And he, and he starts talking about Phyllis McGuire to me or something. You know, he changes the subject. In 1932, Chicago had more newspapers than what they have now. And they had crime reporters. And of course, like the media today, everybody's fighting for a story. And the crime reporters were always fighting for a story, trying to get a story. And there was this one guy who was writing stuff about the you know, Whether it was true or not, I don't know. But you know, he was writing stuff. And you would get this with, uh, you know, several guys. I mean, guys like John Bulldog Drummond. My father would say, don't, anyone, don't talk to him. Don't ever talk to him. Because every time guys talk to him, Joey Ayupa, Sam Giancana, they always had problems. They always had legal problems. I don't know what Bulldog Drummond was doing. I'm not saying he fed any information back. But Art Patak was the same way. Sometimes, if I said, don't talk to Art Patak, you know, stay away from him, that type of stuff. But in 1932, there was this guy who was kind of an aggressive crime reporter. And Paul Rica didn't really like him. And Paul Rica had a saying, he'd always say, make it go away, make it go away. You didn't care how you did it, just make it go away, make it go away. So my father said, okay, I'll take care of it. My father got some, I don't know if it was hydrochloric acid, whatever the acid was, and he threw it in the guy's face, and he blinded the man. The man was blinded. Could never work, could see him anymore. Okay. So I asked my father one time about this. And he said to me, he said, Scott, this is what the life is. We steal, we cheat, we rob, and we do criminal things. This is why I want you to see everything. And you're going to make up your own decision. And I'm not going to tell you. But you're not going in blind. You're not going in like one of these kids. That you think, oh, this is some glamorous life. You're going to see what the life is and what it's all about. The good, the bad, you know, everything, everything about it. So, you know, like I say, by the time I was uh, a senior in high school, I told my mother, I got an application for White Junior College. And I said to my mother, I'm going to go to college. I want to go to college. My older sister had gone to college. I'm my only sister going to college. And I got some pictures, a couple of pictures. See, she was a professional model while she was in college after she worked for Patricia Stevens. And, uh, but I realized that you need an education. And the one thing my father had always told me, he says, whatever education you get, whether it's a formal education, street education, you learn a trade, no one can ever take that education away from you. You have that knowledge. That's your knowledge. You've got it. So I told my mother, I said, look, I'm not going into life. And my mother always knew what my father had done, but she would always, she narrated him, she knew. And she'd always tell him, keep it out of the house, meaning no meetings in the house. And my father never had any meetings in the house. He would talk with me, but he never met with anybody you know, in the house. So I said to him, I said, I don't know how he's going to take it. Then. So I went to say, I, you know, he came home. I said, Dad, I want to talk to you. I said, I got an application for Wright Junior College. I'm not sure what I want to do. So I'm going to junior college to try and take some courses, get the basic stuff out of the way, and then see what I'm interested in, and then go on to a senior college and hopefully get my uh, degree. And, and, and he says, and before I could say I'm not going into life, he says to me, he said, that's great. He said, that's a great thing. He says, Scott, you know what the worst thing a father can do? He says, the worst thing a father can do is trying to push his son into something the son doesn't want to do. Because he's never going to like it, and he's going to hate his father for it. So that's great that you're going to college. So that was, you know, so I, I started at Wright Junior College, and I took their one journalism course. And um, it was uh, very good. I did, you know, I did well, I enjoyed it. And I met this guy from New York who came, he was a friend of the professor, and we're talking a little bit, and I'm talking to him about the first time I went outside of Chicago to see a mob family, and that was in uh, uh, 1961. It was in Newport, Kentucky. Cleveland, Cleveland mob, which in the 1970s, some mob, some families had specialties. The Cleveland mob in the 1970s, theirs was car bombings. So if you didn't like somebody, have them start your car, okay, because they're, they're, there are things where they bomb the people's cars. So, you know, they, they would use nails and, and bombs. It would be kind of rough. 
But Cleveland was partnering with, partnering with the outfit in uh, Newport, Kentucky, on gambling and uh, prostitution, which is right across the border from Cincinnati. It's where the Ohio River in southern Indiana and Kentucky, they you know, kind of meet. So we go there, and the sheriff, if you remember the show Mayberry with uh, Don Knotts playing Barney Fife, this guy is Barney Fife. He's not wearing a gun. So I said to him, I'm, you know, I'm 13 years old. I said, sir, or maybe I call him sheriff. He didn't look like a sheriff. I said, you're not wearing a gun. He says, why start with him? Why cause trouble? He says, without a gun, I don't have to worry about shooting anybody or somebody will shoot back at me. I don't want to hurt anybody. So he was the type of guy, you paid him off, everything went good. It was on, I think, 12th Street in uh, Newport, Kentucky, where you know the gambling and prostitution took place. And like I say, the outfit in Cleveland, my father referred to them as the boys from Mayfield Broke. And they eventually, Cleveland became a partner in the Desert Inn, in the DI. And they would split, and, they, and, the, and the outfit would get a 50% a franchise fee from uh, Cleveland. Now Detroit, we'd see Detroit, we'd see Detroit, and the Detroit guys, one thing about them, they minded their own business. One thing about Detroit, I'll always say, they minded their own business. They dealt a lot with uh, biker gangs, and biker gangs were removing uh, various drugs and various uh, contraband for them. But the one thing I always remember about Detroit is they were involved with the Frontier Hotel, and they, they kept the Frontier for three years. I remember Anthony Zerubi, who goes back to the Purple Gang, way back in the 30s. He said, no, we only needed three years. We're going to get our money out of it. And that's it. And they skimmed $6 million in the three years. And then they sold it to Kansas City, and they moved on. That was, that was Detroit. But like I say, they minded their own business. They weren't bad. Now, with, in Chicago, when I was mentioning earlier, about the corrupt law enforcement, the corrupt police. We had guys who, there were two guys, Albert Sarno and Chris Carter, who while on duty, in uniform, ran their own loan shark business for San G. and Con. They were they with San G. and Con. We had guys in the police department who while in uniform, on duty, would be carrying contraband in the truck, in, in the trunk of their squad car. Either dope, either heroin, dope, are stolen guns because no one, no one who's going to stop, who's going to stop the marked car? Okay? Who stops the marked car? Here, right? So they know how to work and they transport it from A to B, A to B. So when I was going, like I said, going to write, I met this fellow in New York. He's telling me about this school in New York, Long Island University. And uh, I never heard of it. And he says, well, they offer two out-of-state scholarships. And I couldn't afford Northwestern. I'm not sure if I could have got in Northwestern, but I couldn't afford Northwestern, which I would have liked to have gone to the Dill School of Journalism. So I went to the library, I got the address, and I wrote him a letter. And I sent him a copy. I was working part-time on my tax return. And they offered me an academic scholarship. But I was going to have to pay for the room and board, which was $600. And this was September 1968. So in September of 1968, I went to New York. I'd never been to New York, <laughs> never seen New York. And I'm saying to myself after two weeks, so I want to stay here. There's 8 million people. Everything is jammed up. Everybody's talking fast. I couldn't understand guys from the Bronx or Brooklyn. They didn't make no sense to me. And uh, I wasn't sure if I wanted to stay. So while I was thinking about that, we started school September 17th of 1968. I'm sitting in a class with this guy. Now, the school was about 7,000 undergraduate and about 4,000 graduate students. And the dormitory was 500 people. So I'm sitting with the guy. He's a commuter student. And he says, I'm looking for work. I've got to pay for the board. Now, I had saved up some money from working, but I was going to need money for the next semester. And he says, I said, you know, I need a job. He said, what can you do? So I said, well, I can work my social clubs. He goes, like this, mob social clubs? So I thought, you know, the guy, like, maybe I shook him up or something, you know. <laughs> he says, let me see what I can do. So the next class period, he comes back with the name. He says, my uncle kind of knows this guy. You call him up, mention my uncle's name. 
See if he's interested in talking with you. <laughs> so now this is in Bensonhurst in Brooklyn. Now Bensonhurst, if you think how Taylor Street was in the 1940s and 50s, this was Bensonhurst. After the war, Bensonhurst was about 50% Jewish and 50% Italian. By the mid-1950s, it was about 80% Italian. The Jewish people moved out to Long Island or Jersey. They moved out of Bensonhurst, out of Brooklyn. So the place is called Wimpy's, and the guy's name is Charles Scarpa. And Charles Scarpa Sr. is the owner. Now Charles Scarpa Sr., later on, uh, earlier, well, maybe a little bit later on, the FBI used him, as they did in a lot of cases. And he was involved in finding the murders of the three civil rights guys in Philadelphia, Mississippi. They went to Scarpa and Scarpa. You know, he used mob ways to find guys. So I go to see Scarf and he's looking at me, yeah, yeah, okay. The kid, he says, I'm gonna ask you one question. What happens, what happens when you keep, when you're not supposed to talk, what do you, what do, you do? And I said, oh no, he says, he says to me, he says, kid, what do you do when you're not gonna talk at all? And I said, the only time you open up your mouth is for a dentist. Kid, you got the job. <laughs> and that was, that, was an, that was an old mob sense. I knew that going in. And the reason I was, I'm glad I knew it, because Charles Scarpa was known as the Grim Reaper. He was responsible for over 120 murders. He was a Colombo guy. And he was a contract killer. And he was a very, very, very violent guy who died in the 1980s from HIV. He had surgery, and he got bad blood. And he died in the 80s. That's what Scarpa told him. So, that's how I started working. I started working in the Colombo Mob Social Club. And I would, it was a bar. And in those days in New York, the drinking age was 18 and I was 20. So I was, you know, I was working there. And then I got an offer to work in the Lucchese crime family in Queens. And I worked Bonanno. But in the Lucchese crime family in Queens, the social club I worked was a place called the Hotel. And the Hotel was a bar. And that's where I met all the real good fellows. I knew every one of them. I knew Jimmy Burke, I knew Henry Hill, I knew Paul Barrio, I knew, I knew every guy, every, every one of them. And the movie made them out to be much better guys than what they really were. Henry Hill was no Ray Liotta. Henry Hill was a twerpy guy. Paul Barrio, who Paul Savino played the character Paulie, was a very violent guy. When he dated women, he could just snap. If they say something he didn't like it, he'd take a, a, one of these miniature baseball bats, he'd hit the woman in the face. And Paul Vario was having an affair with Karen Hill, Henry Hill's wife. Now the real Tommy, the character that Joe Pesci played, was, the real name was Tommy B. Simone. I met Tommy B. Simone, he was my age, he was 20 years old. He had already killed three guys. He killed this one guy in Brooklyn. The guy's name was Howard Goldstein. And Mr. Goldstein was walking down the street. Just like how you might be walking from the parking lot here. And Tommy called him a bad name to get his attention. He turned around and he fired what they, you know, three, what they call three in the head. It was behind the three in the head. Three in the head. And so I asked Tommy later, you know, I met Tommy, I heard about this. I said, Tommy, why did you kill Mr. Goldstein? Did he owe you money? Was, he, was it mob involved? What was going on with him? He said, no, I didn't know the guy. But I got a new gun, and I had to try it out. <laughs> that was Tommy, OK? Tommy was the type of guy, if you played cards with him, well, he was throwing the cards at you, he was throwing the dots at you. Joe Pesci was probably a con Tommy. Tommy was a very, very violent guy. And Tommy was the type of guy who wasn't going to play by the rules. And these are the rules. When a guy gets made, when a guy is made, it's like having seniority in the union. You can't really get rid of the guy. When a guy gets made, if you're going to whack a guy, you want to kill a guy, you have to have a sit-down meeting, basically. That doesn't always happen, but basically the guy has that right to ask for a sit-down. There were two Gambino guys. One was Ben Benista, who was in the movie. And he was the guy who came out. The, the real line that was said, Ben Benisa said to uh, Tommy DiSimone was, are you still shining shoes? Not get your shine box. 
That wasn't the line. Are you still shining shoes? Because Ben Benista had just gotten there, had a prison. He was a long shot. He was a Gambino guy, and he was made. And here's where the problem developed, eventually for Tommy. Okay. Tommy killed Ben Benista, as you saw in the movie, if you saw it with us. Ben Benista had started out the street group, and the street crew boss was named Carmen Fatika, which doesn't mean anything to you. But one of the members of the street crew, who Ben Benista was very friendly with, and I think you might know this guy's name, John Gotti. Okay? So now, when they killed Ben Benista, okay, as you saw in the movie, John Gotti was going for retribution, was going to go for retribution at some point. Because Tommy, being a Lucchese guy, killed a maid Gambino guy. No good. No good at all. Okay, no good. Tommy was very interested in Karen Hill. Interested in the point where he asked her out for dinner, walked her back to the apartment, and tried to rape her. She got in, closed the door, but she told Paul Vario what happened. Okay, Tommy, we're going to fix your wig. Tommy sells, basically sells, I mean, Paul Vario basically sells Tommy to John Gotti. He's going to be yours. So that's when they set up, like you saw in the movie, where Tommy was going to be made. Now, New York still had the ceremony. Chicago doesn't have the ceremony. They're making a guy. There's not a ceremony. It's basically, you're going to be made, that's it. It's kind of like an eighth grade graduation at St. Philip's or something. Right? Okay. That's it. You're made. New York still has the ceremony. They talk about being faithful to your wife, which they're not faithful. You know, all the, all the nonsense. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so they set it up in the Bronx. The location for crime family is basically from the Bronx. So they set it up in the Bronx, and Tommy comes, Tommy DeSimone comes in, and all the Lucchese guys who are going to sponsor him, we'll be right back, Tommy. They walk out, and Tommy's sitting like I'm standing next to you, and John Gotti comes in from behind and puts him three in what they call three in the hat, and I talk about it in the book. And three in the hat is three shots in the back of the head. That's what they mean. When they say three in the hat, three shots in the back of the head. Yeah. And he killed Tommy Deesmore. And he was 28 years old at the time. Now, Tommy came from a mobbed up family. His two uncles were part of the Los, a Los Angeles mob. His two he had two brothers that were Gambino guys. One of them got killed. So Tommy came from a mobbed up family. His life expectancy wasn't going to be real long okay, because of this. But all of these guys, like I say, uh, were not guys that looked as good as the movie made them. Jimmy Burke was the type of guy who was a stone cold kid. Stone Cold. He was like Whitey Bulger. I met Whitey Bulger. I met him twice. I met him in Boston twice. I knew a couple of his guys. They had his because they were all Irish. Whitey Bulger was from um, Winter Hill in South Boston. And when you're in South Boston, in the bars there, and in those days, every corner had a bar. Because mainly Irish, and every corner had a bar. And in Irish neighborhood bars move, you know, things happen. There's a song that they sing called I'm a Southie. You'll hear that, I'm a Southie, I'm a Southie. And, it's, and it's, it's like a unifying song that is South Boston against everybody. Okay, South Boston against everybody. Ben Affleck is from South Boston. Everybody, everybody's, we're, we're against everybody. We've got the chip on, chip on our shoulder, chip on our shoulder, and we're, we're against everybody. And I met Bulger, and it was called the Triple X Bar. And that's what his basic operations were. And Bulger was like Jimmy Burke, Stone Cold Killer. See it on his face. Stone cold. stone cold killer. Now Burke, when you'd be in the social club with Burke, he would be talking to Tommy D. Simone and this other guy, Angelo C. P. Now C. P. was the guy, if you remember the movie, he was the guy that they found in the meat wagon hanging on the hook. But that's not really how he died. But that's that was it. He was involved with killing the Samuel L. Jackson character. Now I knew Stax, who was the real guy that Samuel L. Jackson portrayed. He was a blues player. I said to him, Stax, stay away from these guys. And like I talk about in the book, I had a very low batting average because I try and talk guys out of mob life. But I had a low batting average. They weren't going to listen to me. And Stax said, no, everything's going to be cool. Everything's good. I said, pursue your music, Stax. 
stay away from these guys. You're going to have a problem. And Stamps had a problem. On the Lufthansa deal, which was $6.4 million that was sold, Stax's responsibility was to take the van, take it to Jersey, take it to a guy who was going to take it to a chop shop. It was a stolen van. What does Stax do? He goes to Brooklyn, parks the van in a no parking zone, leaves the van. Now, two Brooklyn uniformed officers who have gotten information over the radio about a van that was involved in the Lufthansa deal are now looking and they find the van. They find some guy's fingerprints on the van. Jimmy Burke is going crazy. He says, Stack's got to go. I'm going to push the button. When you give an order in the mob, the term that they use is pushing the button. You're going to push the button on the guy. So he was pushing the button on the guy. And he wanted Tommy D. Salone and Angelo Stevens to be the shooters, and they were. So they were, they, like I say, those guys, the good fellow guys were all violent criminal guys. When, when, when they had the trial, in the early 90s, I saw Henry, I met Henry, I saw Henry Hill again in 1981. And it was about that time they were doing front shaking, it was a front shaking scandal. They were involved with the Boston College. There was a player named Rick Coon, he was the center the Boston College team, and he was throwing the game, basically. And, and everything in, in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, college basketball, pro basketball is a big bet sport. So whatever the spread is, just like football, you're trying to see if you can beat the spread. Well, Henry Hill was involved, and Jimmy Burke was somewhat involved, but not really involved. So these guys get indicted. And Henry Hill is talking. He's making the deal because he's going to go into the witness relocation program. Now, the witness relocation program is run by the U.S. Marshal's office. Run by the U.S. Marshal's office. And what happens was when Henry Hill was called as a witness, Edward Bassano was the prosecutor of the land, now in private industry. He says, Mr. Hill, point, point out. Jimmy Burke, point out Paul Barry. Henry Hill turns his head. Where are they? I don't, I don't quite see him. McDonald asks the judge for a recess, 15 minute recess. He tells Henry Hill, he says, Henry, look, we got a deal. Either you cooperate with me, the deal's withdrawn, and I'll prosecute you. So Henry Hill goes back in. He doesn't look at Jimmy Burke. He doesn't look at the whole barrio. Uh, like, yeah, that, that, I think that's them over there. Yeah, that's them over there. Yeah, that, yeah, that's them. He's not looking at them. So they get convicted. Now it's sentencing. Everybody got, Kuhn got 10 years. He got the most, except for one guy. Phoenix, Arizona. We go to Tacoma, Washington, Boise, Idaho, Northern California, Arizona. And they give you an Irish name. I remember Sammy Gravano. They gave him the name Jimmy O'Brien. He looks like Jimmy O'Brien, like I look like Sammy Gravano. And he didn't like it. I knew a guy from the outfit. They gave him the name, and he couldn't remember it. He had to write it down and keep it in his billfold because he couldn't remember the name. You know. So Henry Hill was a real problem. He was pulling scams. He was involved with narcotics. They kept moving him from city to city. And Paul Vario died in 1980. 1989, so he didn't have to worry about Paul Barrio. Jimmy Burke was still alive in prison. Jimmy Burke in 19, 19, uh, uh, 1996, he died from in prison. So Henry Hill had it pretty much easy until 2012 when he died. Now when Henry died, in 1989, Karen Hill divorced Henry. She went back to New York. The FBI says, this is Hill, don't go back, because they're going to come looking for you if they want Henry. They're going to ask you, where's Henry? Where's Henry? And she didn't care. She had enough of Henry Hill. She didn't want it. So when Henry died, she didn't claim his body. His two kids claimed the body. That was it. And he died in 2012. Now, being in New York, 
like I said, I worked with Nano. I knew the real Sopranos. They were the Decal Cavante family. I knew them very well, a lot of them. And they were very dysfunctional. I didn't have cable, I never saw the Sopranos. The guy I would have said for the technical advisor was Joe Pistoni. And Joe Pistoni was the, uh, uh, he was the FBI agent in the movie Donnie Brasco, and I knew all those guys. So, you know, from the movies. But uh, the uh, Decal Cavante family, like I said, they were a very dysfunctional family. They were Jersey's own family, and they ran the rackets in North Jersey. And one of the guys who ran the rackets in the North Jersey for him was a guy named Angelo Gip De Carlo. And he was friends with these guys who were putting together a singing group. They had a, they had a singing group, and they were going to put out a record. And uh, he called WABC, and he spoke with the station manager. And he said to me, he said, well, I got these guys, I, I, they're friends of mine, and I want to talk about, you know, I want you to put the record out there. This is in September of 1962. And the guy says, no, I don't even know who these guys are. Forget about it. So the next day, a couple guys go visit him, and they, you know, punch him around a little bit. And he decides, he tells the disc jockey, WABC, why don't you play this song by these guys? Just play it once, and forget about it. Well, the song was Sherry, and the singing group was Four Seasons. And that's how the Four Seasons started. Okay, as a song. So, okay. now I don't know, is that it for the time? Because we're, I, we're run, we want to get some time in for yes, questions. Yes, I'm sorry, if I've been going too long, honestly, I apologize. No, no, that's okay. Once I get going. We, we know we'd love to hear more, but our, 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 our people are kind of chomping at the bit for a little bit of questions. First one I'd like to ask you is, uh, what are your conclusions about the life? And does it really do any good to help stabilize a city? Or is it just, uh, I mean... No, no, you know, some, they, they, someone's asked me that. And, you know, they said, well, the only thing that helps is where these guys live in the neighborhood, okay? Because they stabilize the neighborhood. I'll give you an example of that. Joe Lombardo, for 40 years, owned a house on, what was it, 22, 24 West Ohio, okay? And Joe was the type of guy, in the summertime, he'd ride his bicycle around the neighborhood. Now, that neighborhood changed. Get your ticket. And the neighborhood had very few blocks of Italians left, maybe old Italians. Everybody was out of that neighborhood. It was a Hispanic neighborhood. It was a gang neighborhood. Latin kings were in and around that neighborhood. But in that area, maybe a five or six block area, where the Italians lived, and Joe Lombardo was riding his bicycle, he never had a problem. He never had a problem. 12 o'clock at night, I could take you down to that neighborhood. 1 o'clock in the morning, say, I'll see you. You could stand on the corner. But as far as stabilizing the city, see, in the life, the first conversation is about money, and the last conversation is about money. So if you wanted someone to do, to stabilize the city, sure, we'll stabilize it, but this is what we want. This is what we want for the This is what we want. I hope that answered your question. Okay, no, that, that's fine. Uh, who's the... Uh, Who's the current head of the Chicago mob, and who are the other top top uh, guys? Sal, Sal De, I know Sal. Sal De Laurentiis, Sal D. He's he's right. There's four crews left. Okay, there's four. And I'll tell you who the you know, street crews are. There's four street crews left. There's Grand Avenue, which is run by Al Bivina, who is a very very violent guy, very extremely violent. Uh, shot uh, a police detective who is monitoring him was very fortunate Alpi saw him this was about 20 years ago and I haven't seen Alpi in about 25 or 30 years because I do not see anybody because I do not trust anybody yeah because they're gonna want to talk about stuff and I know things about them let's say there's no statute of limitations when I know about them so it's gonna tell you what I know about them so the police detective he was in the car he's monitoring the Alpi and Alby works out of, you know, if you know where La Scrala restaurant is, it's on 875 Milwaukee, North Milwaukee. Okay. And it's, there's a hotel there called Arcadia Hotel. And La Scrala restaurant is right there. Joe Lombardo used to they have table one there, like how Irv Cupson used to have table one. You know. 
and, and, and Albie works, he's on the second floor, I know where he's there. So Albie sees, he sees the police detective, and he fires at the car. The bullet's going at the police detective. The police detective don't know that, because he's looking forward. Albie's shooting from this direction. The police detective bends down to get his notebook. The bullet goes through the driver's side, the window, goes across, and goes into the, uh, where the passenger door is, the upper part, you know, the door. And the police detective was very lucky, because he would have caught it right here, and, and possibly killed him. You know. So Albie is very, very violent. Um, the second street crew that's available is 26th Street. Now, 26th Street was named 26th Street by the feds. See, the feds like to give nicknames. Joey the Clown Lord. No one ever called
Okay, our speaker gets the last word. Thank you very much. Basically, how the outfit works. Basically, how the outfit works is they get in businesses. Now, some of the ways they get in businesses is people, when they're gambling. Louder, please. When, when, people, when people are gambling. Louder. Hello? It's, it's, it's working. Just, oh, uh, no. just a little closer to your mouth. Okay. Is that okay now? Yes. What happens is when guys are gambling and own a business, a lot of them put their business up as a loan. And of course, they can't pay back on the loan. So the outfit usually takes over, and I talk about this in the book, usually 65 to 70 percent of the business. Now, if they'll let the guy run the business for about 30 or 35 percent. If the guy owns a building, after about a year, they'll want the building, they'll set the building on fire to get insurance money. Okay? Anything that the outfit could get involved with, they will get involved with. Any type of a business they will get involved with if you get involved with them, okay? If you get involved with them. If you don't get involved with them, you'll never have a problem. My father used to always say you know, he was involved with organizing the hits of 300 people, about 300. And he always, and I'd say to him, i say, doesn't it bother you? You're taking people's lives, you're taking them away from families? He said, they made the decision to get involved with us. That was their decision. No one, no one, no one put a gun to their head. That's which is true. Which is true. No one has ever forced. No one has ever forced. You don't know if that dentist is uh, is one of them. You don't know whether that mechanic uh, in the machine well, shop is one of them. Well, sir, you have them. your opinions. Let him finish. You have, you have your opinion. And that's fine. The, the country is still America. The science is America. So they have their opinion. And that's okay. <coughs> that's fine. But I'm telling you from the inside, sir, and it's something you're not. Just like I couldn't tell you about your business, whatever you did for your livelihood. I would have no right to say things other than it would be my opinion. It doesn't mean it would be right or wrong, but I don't know what you did for, the, for what your business or that was. But I know this business, sir, and I'm all about this business. Believe me. Okay. And if you opened up your mouth to someone, that's why you got what you got. Okay. Real, your teeth real quick. Yes, sir. Um, can you just very briefly describe our president's ties to the mob? Oh, yeah. Of course. Tony, Tony Ducks Corello. Tony Ducks Corello? Yeah, and I'll talk about him if you would like him to come in. Yeah, of course. Okay. Is that brief enough? Is that okay? That's yeah. fine. And I don't mean sarcastically. I know because you no, said no, brief. No, no, I, I know. I what he does. <laughs> um, are you familiar with the book by David K. Johnson called Donald Trump? No, I'm not. You might like to read it because he does. he's an investigative reporter who's done a lot to uncover that world of Trump's connections with the mob. Yeah, Tony Ducks, Anthony, Anthony Tony Ducks Corral, Genovese guy, yes, sir. Okay. In New York? Yes, yes. Okay. I know all about it. All right, and before you close up, plug your book and give us a little bit about more about yourself. Well, the name, of, again, the name of my book is Inside, and it's sold on uh, Amazon, uh, putting in my name, and then Scott M. Hoffman, then Inside, you'll see the book. Or if you want to get it through uh, Barnes & Noble, you can order it through Barnes & Noble, they'll order it for you. And basically, besides involvement with writing, what I do, it's funny you're talking about politics, is that I work as a paid political consultant for two teams to yeah, into the political action committees. Okay. And I've done political work for over 40 years. Okay. So I'm pretty experienced in getting out the vote. And we did very well. Uh, basically, what I was involved with nursing homes, assisted living places, yeah, yeah. getting out the vote there. And we did very, very well for J.B. Pritzker, the Democratic Party. And uh, why did you write the book? And tell us a little bit about the writing process. Well, the reason I wrote the book was it was a subject matter I knew very, very well. And people would always say to me, Scott, why don't you write a book? Why don't you write a book? So when I retired, of course, you have the time. Okay, and I would write every morning, 7.30 in the morning. That's when I would start writing. So, no. I mean, how many hours you put in? Five, six, four, three? No, I mean, an hour, at least about an hour, hour and a half a day. Okay. 
and then how long did it take to get the book? It took me two years to write the book, and it took about another six months or so to get someone to look at it and then publish it. Because uh, I had 20 rejections on the book. Really? I had 18, 18 times it came back in the same FedEx box. They never opened up the box. Yeah. Okay. They never looked at the box. Mm -hmm. And the other two rejections were not. They told me get an agent or they don't look at unsolicited yeah. material. Which I thought the others were going to say they don't look at unsolicited. Because mostly they work through an agent. But the other 18 times, they just sent it back in the same FedEx box that yeah. I sent it. Never opened it. Could you tell us something about the assassination of Kennedy? Who do you think done it? Well, I, I know it from the mob side. I don't I don't want to hold you, gentlemen, if you yeah. gotta go. No, no. I mean I'm, I'll stay. No, we gotta go. Oh we gotta go. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, gotta go. About, yeah. no. we got about three minutes left, so <laughs> it's a matter of about Kennedy. Basically it was it was the commission, the mob commission. There was a mob commission for nine members. Nine members of the mob commission, and Sam Giancana in Chicago had a seat on the commission. And everything really goes back to Cal Neva. The whole story goes back to Cal Neva, which is a separate story of Cal Neva, and the casino and everything. That's another story. But basically what it was at Sam Giancana, because he was fed up, of course, what was going on with Robert Kennedy, who was a real snake in the grass. That's another story, a real snake in the grass. Okay. And he got the commission, and they were upset with Kennedy because he, Kennedy's idea was this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring guys in. I'm going to turn them into snitches, mob guys. And they're going to wrap the bosses out, the cop holes out, and we're going to get rid of the mob. This was Kennedy's idea. So the commission wasn't going to go with that. Okay? The outfit's been around for over 100 years, sir, so you're not getting rid of people. So what happened was they gave the order. The order was given to two people. It was given to Carlo Marcello, in New Orleans, who I knew Carlo Marcello very well, and Santo Traficante, who I knew very well also, and introduced me to B.B. Rebozo, Charles B.B. Rebozo, which is another story. Yeah. Okay. You have to come back someday. Yes. Yeah. I think more. Yeah, but, but they were the ones who were ordered to do it. And that's, a, I know we got a time constraint. Yeah, they're trying to do the clean back. So, I don't, I, I, if you want me to come back, I can talk to them. Yeah, much more I have a show of hands. Who wants the speaker to come back and tell us more about all this? You already did this once. Okay, thank you. Well, not just who is who, cool, but how they, they operate. operate. We would like they to know how they operate. All right, yeah. all right. All right. Thank you very much. Give our speaker a hand. Why don't you adjourn us, Andy, and we'll get on our way. Thank you very much. We're adjourned for the night, thank and we're already for you. Uh, holding up the cleaners. They got to get in here and clean the place. So thank you very much for the back as swiftly as you can. Thank you very much. And we're adjourned.